My name is Sebastian and in this video I'm going to show you how to build effective developer workflows with Quarkus and what you need for that. So first of all, I want you to understand what does it mean to have an effective developer workflow. So that's really the setup while you're coding, while your hands are on the keyboard and you're writing code or reading code and implementing features and what you need or what should be optimized in order to be more effective. And Quarkus is a great technology to do that. It's one of the best um, technologies for enterprise Java to implement such a workflow. And I want to go over a few things. So first of all, you probably have heard the notation of the flow experience, that experience when we're totally immersed in a task, when we're solving a problem, when you're coding, you forget the world around you, you forget how much time is passing and you're just fully focused. You're just fully, as we say, in the flow. So that requires a few well prerequisites and also some technologies are better uh, served or better put up than others. And especially, well, it requires a few things. What I want to focus on in this video is how to focus on that main thing, like that main task that we're trying to solve, that we should aim to reduce all the small context switches and sort of going back and forth um, in, in, in our work. And thirdly, to not make us wait while we're coding. And this is a really important thing. And in order to show you these things, I, of course, have an example project. So again, it's not that much about the technology. Quarkus helps a lot with this. You could set up or you could implement these, these points with different technologies, of course. It's more of a way of thinking. So here I have my uh, Quarkus Playground project. And let's start with that last part that don't make me wait. And this is probably something that Quarkus is most known for from, the, uh, from a developer perspective. So if I switch over to my terminal and if I ask myself, how do I start up Quarkus typically or in the best way for the development mode with uh, that you can start with Maven Quarkus call on dev that then well starts up Quarkus as you can see here, but it still has the connection to the code and you can just keep coding. So I'm probably showing you uh, not something new. You probably know this when you're using Quarkus, but I want to point this out that that technology is one of the best uh, ways out there to say, for example, now I would like to access my application and uh, for example, while well, just invoke my code. If I have some hello world a resource here for my uh, what is called coffee shop project, I can say curl localhost 8080. I go to coffee and I have the response here. And now if I change something in the system, this is now just a very tiny change that I change a string, then the application restarts and I get that response. But I want to point out how important that is that you say actually my code can well just run and I see the changes in the running re um, application being reflected. Because now what I can do and what I should do, I also adapt my test and my test environment for that. So again, the point is don't make me wait. What would typically in the more legacy world uh, be the case here? Well, you have to rebuild your application and then you have to wait until it rebuilds and restarts and then you can access it and then you see the code change. Now you see the code change immediately. And the same is true for your test setup. You don't want to wait. So for example, what I could do, uh, first of all, let's undo this change. First of all, I could set up a very simple uh, unit test for example, something like coffee shop test. And I know this is sort of ridiculous to just test for a string here, but to emphasize that point, if I say I would like to run this, for example, in my IDE, then I see, okay, great. Now that screen, everything works. So to just show you, if I break that test, if I run it again, okay, then here it's red, it doesn't work. So that's the point. Like how long did I have to wait? Not much. I just had a single keystroke to run or rerun uh, that test run and then I get the feedback. The same is true for the Quarkus experience. Why? Because it includes the ability to run tests, which is really helpful in the Quarkus dev mode. If I press typically I press O for toggle test output and R to have this what is called continuous testing, then immediately it fails. Why? Well, because my uh, code now breaks for that system, uh, sorry, for that unit test. So if I say I would like to fix it, well, I change my production code or my test code here, of course, and then I rerun it. And we had the change here before. Now it was restarting. Um, and now both have the dot here. So just to show this uh, to you again, if I change it, 
now the test is failing and I can press this and rerun this very, very quickly just by pressing R. And you see that's also the point, don't make me wait. To run this with Quark as well, it keeps the tests and everything compiled in the background so it is super fast to execute it. This is actually the fastest way to run your test because even your IDE takes a little bit of, of spinning uh, while you, well, after you press that key and then it shows you the result, but now you see this immediately. And the good news is this can be done and should be done also for more integrative tests. So I'm not talking about the sort of code level integration test because that's a different story and I created a lot of content about that in the past why I would actually stay away from tests that, well, that are integrated too much with your test um, environment lifecycle so that trying to fire up environment, try to start the application, why it makes you wait, it's too slow but instead to have a test that already accesses this locally running application, what we've just seen, but now just from a proper automated test example. So I have a smoke integration test, smoke IT, that are calling this way, that actually accesses my application here via localhost 8080 and says, okay, I you know get the coffee response, the hello world response, or I you know can order some coffee and now you can have a very sophisticated um, test scenario as you should and would have. But the point is now you can run this also in that very uh, specific and quick way. For example, first of all, I can start this in my IDE. So this runs really, really quickly. And then I see, okay, well, it uh, tries to uh, connect now to localhost. Okay, I stopped my um, Quark is deaf again because I wanted to show you uh, something else. But if I now rerun uh, my test, now you see, okay, the test runs, it is red, why? Well, because it also aims to check for coffee dot. Now let's fix the test, I run it again, and now it's green. So you see, this is the type of feedback or the waiting time that you should have. I change something in my production code or I change something in my test code, I press a single keystroke and then I get the result. So this is a development workflow that doesn't make you wait. And if you think about it, you're much more in that flow experience because you're not well, you don't have the danger that you're waiting and then what happens? Well, we're human. So of course I pull out my phone or check my emails or whatever, and then I'm distracted and then my flow experience is gone. But the good news is you can do this even faster. You can have this in your Quarkus dev mode as well. So Quarkus usually um, works in the same way like we have on Ma in Maven that it excludes IT's integration tests via, via this pattern if something ends with IT for integration test. So if you set the exclude pattern to empty, so usually it's something like star IT, and now it runs all of the tests including your IT's. So if I say run my tests again, now well, first of all, my coffee shop test fails. So that's the unit test. Let's fix the coffee shop uh, test here again. And now you see this happened actually very quickly while I'm switching my window, all the tests are passing. So let's do this again. I want to change something in my production code and then change the test code accordingly. I go to my coffee shop and say, okay, now it should be coffee exclamation mark. I change this, I switch over immediately. I see the new result. I can run it again, run it again. So this shows me, okay, it fails now both my unit test and my system test. So it runs this as well. Let's fix the unit test first, make an exclamation mark. Now it shows me two tests were run. One is now passing, one is failing. Okay, now only the IT is failing. Let's fix this as well. Change that and now all tests are passing. I can run it again, running again. And now this is my whole test suite of these uh, tests that I have, both, co uh, both code level tests and integration uh, tests that access by HTTP. And that is just one example how you should set up your well test environment and your development environment so that it doesn't make you wait. And I know this is a very simplified example of just some hello world, but I do the same in more complex projects. Actually, once your project becomes more complex, it's even more important that your test suite runs in a very effective way. So if you want to check out more uh, material there, I have a lot of content on testing. I have a whole video course on how to set this up effectively with Quarkus. I think this is a very important topic. Why? Because then it doesn't make you wait. So the waiting time is really crucial for that setup here while we're coding. 
Again, if you have a more complex setup, so here I'm not using a database yet, I just have to access here. That also works if you have a database, if you have a local setup, for example, using containers, this integrates really well with Quarkus, um, or if you have a third party external system that you access via HTTP, for example, something like this, this also integrates with this approach because then you can set up um, your whole test environment locally using containers, using Docker Compose, using Kubernetes if you want. There are more ways available. That's not the point uh, of this video, the point is, set up a development workflow that doesn't make you wait like whatever you do it shouldn't make you wait for more than two seconds while you're coding including running your test suite including your acceptance tests so that's that now the next point uh, that i want to focus uh, on a little bit is is well that to focus so while we're coding build up a development workflow that allows you to focus on the main thing so what is that? What is the main thing? Well, the main thing is how to implement a feature, right? That is this sort of work, well, this deep thinking, this creative work that we're paid to do as developers. And you shouldn't spend too much time, or at least not all the time, not every day, on solving something that is non-essential. For example, well, if I uh, implement a feature, then I need to test and deploy my, my software. So how to build and run and test my software should be done, of course, in an automated way. I shouldn't every day anew uh, have to think of, oh, wait a second, how do I run and deploy this again? Or even to type these commands or even to search in your history and run these commands again. So this should be done in an automated way. And while you're coding locally, it doesn't have to be a super fancy and sophisticated workflow with some you know, nice technology. It can be very simple, something like a bash script to just say, okay, what do I need in order to build this? Well, just execute the commands in order to do that. You know, if you have something like a running application server that you need to deploy to, if that's what you're working with or whatever it is, even if it's just two, three commands, automate this and make sure that you're not focusing on something that is non-essential right so that's what i also now had in my setup i was just focusing on the code here and i say i changed some code and i'm just switching my window and it's already there again it doesn't have to be the setup can be anything else can be a single keystroke that runs then a script to rebuild and rerun and redeploy everything the point is you want to focus on that main thing Another example is, for example, documentation. If you say, okay, what again is this application scoped? I don't know. Well, your IDE has a nice integration to show you, for example, some Java doc, or you can uh, jump to the code here and then read this through or see it yourself. Also works really well with open source um, frameworks such as Quarkus that you just see, okay, actually how this is implemented and things like that. So you shouldn't, uh, you know, solve a big side quest of then uh, Googling or, you know, Stack Overflowing or JetGPTing around, okay, actually how does this work? So you can have this integrated in a better way. Or for example, to say you have your guides, your Quarkus guides ready at hand to just switch over, you know, to open this up in a website. Or you can, you know, have your JetGPT support or whatever open up uh, in a different browser and you just uh, quickly can switch over. So you don't really have to wait. You can focus on just what you're trying to do. You have your tools that support you at hand and then you know, you're know you more effective, so that's for sure. Another example is, uh, for example, to Im include some persistence here, to say, I want to um, now have a database, so not just uh, this uh, example with in memory with my uh, coffee shop uh, application here. So that's another example, one uh, single example of how Quarkus helps you with the so-called dev services. For example, if I include a database access here, then typically in order to set this up locally, I then have to find out, oh, again, how do I start up my Postgres database? Uh, do I have to download and install? Or what is the Docker command again? And things like that. Or you say, um, if I would like to, for example, have uh, Quarkus uh, Hibernate or M and Nash, as a dependency for my uh, Quarkus application. And then also, for example, JDBC PostgreSQL for the Postgres driver. Then what Quarkus does, if I restart this now, you will see this in the background, it will already start so-called dev services to start up a database. So basically, 
you tell it, hey, I would like to include this now to you know have some database access. And it tries to see, okay, what is your config of your database? Well, you don't have any, so here is a database for you. And what it does in the background, it starts up a uh, Postgres um, database, this one here that just has been started. And you see, okay, now with, um, you know, with a random port, so it doesn't collide with anything that might be running locally. So now I have a database available that I just can use. So it's the same principle that you say, okay, focus on the main thing. What do I want to do? Well, I want to focus on uh, my coffee entities here and then how to, you know, do the typical JPA mapping and things like that. I don't want to spend a lot of time like, hey, how again do you start up a database and things like this? So this is just an example for that. Of course, uh, then for a more um, sophisticated workflow to not make you wait, you wouldn't like to start up that dev services each and every time. Then you might, for example, use containers and have a script and have that config available so it's more effective. But again, it's that uh, question of how can I focus on the main thing? And the last thing that I want to point out is that you should reduce the so-called context switches. So reduce switching around a lot back and forth and especially to use your keyboard more. So what I mean with these small context switches is, well, or all sorts of switching and going back and forth, for example, your hand movements, you know, on your keyboard, that it really helps if you have a setup where, well, as a as a challenge, don't where you're not touching the mouse. So while you're coding, don't touch your mouse. So this works really well. It sounds uh, in the beginning a little bit over uh, overly crazy, but your IDE, for example, here, you can do anything that you need by just the keyboard, right? So I have this idea of Vim mapping, this Vim setup, but you don't even need this. I mean, anything like that, if you would like to switch, that's all one here on the setup, if you would like to switch over uh, to this uh, project view and then go around, or of course you switch your workspaces, that should be uh, done in a very easy way. If you would like to execute your test or start something, all of these commands, you should be able to trigger with the keyboard. So that's why I'm, why I'm mentioning this uh, like that while you're coding, don't touch your mouse. So I'm not saying trying to learn uh, by heart every single keyboard shortcut there is in your IDE or in your system and setup. You won't be able to because there are just hundreds and thousands literally, but all of the things that you typically need. There might be some refactoring feature that you use once in a blue moon so that you don't want to learn that keyboard shortcut by heart and that's you know fair enough. But the things that you always use, you know, the typical shortcuts from navigating in your code, how to switch to the other class, how to jump and follow the um, these references, how to rename a method, how to create a new class and things like that. All of that should be done without touching your mouse and of course the same with your development workflow. How do I switch the windows? How to execute my tests? How do I run and deploy my software? Things like that. The terminal helps a lot for this, but just in general, regardless of your setup, you should not be able to, you know, or be required to move the mouse around a lot while you're coding. It might be a different thing when you're browsing a website. I get that. But just in general, for your default work, try to keep it on the keyboard and you will be much, much faster. So as some takeaways, in order to build effective workflows, especially with Quarkus, first of all, build up a workflow that doesn't make you wait. So just always be able to keep coding, keep thinking and not, you know, letting them break your flow by just these waiting times because that gets really annoying. And on the other hand, it's really, really nice and enjoyable to have an, a workflow that doesn't make you wait. And secondly, have in reach what of what you need. So the documentation at hand that you can quickly switch over. So build up that uh, workflow in the beginning of your coding session. Some scripts might help you. You know, you can automate that too, that you say, I always start up my same browser, uh, windows and tabs in, in this and this formation. Why not automate that, right? So then while you're coding, uh, you don't have to uh, set this up. You don't have to divert from your main task. And uh, thirdly, as some challenge while you're coding, don't touch the mouse, just stay on the keyboard. Maybe you want to take this as a new year resolution challenge. So I hope this was helpful and interesting to watch. If you want to have more content on development workflows and developer productivity in general, I have video courses on that topic, specifically with Quarkus, but also in general, you might check them out. And I hope this was helpful and thanks a lot for watching. Bye.